Welcome once again, my fellow manipulators of digital fate. I'm Richie, this is Capricorn, and today we have spoiler season day four, five, and six that we're going to cover. It's all of the weekend spoilers. I decided to wait and round them all up into one video because typically on the weekends we see less spoilers than on weekdays, so I figured it was better to just cover them all in one big video than have a bunch of little tiny videos. So four, five, and six. Tons of spoilers to go over today, everything from the weekend. I'm excited to dig in. Before we do, make sure you like if you haven't already. It's you guys liking the video every time that has helped this channel to get to 10,000 subscribers. Pretty crazy that, that we're already there and uh, we, we blew right past it. So thank you guys that have been helping, that have been liking the videos and all of that, commenting, sharing, all that stuff really helps. It means a lot and it honestly helps the channel more than you would ever think it would. And if you're new here, make sure you subscribe so you never miss an upload. Tons of crazy spoiler videos on the way. Tons of crazy brews. Ideas are just brewing in my brain right now for early access for Bloomboro. So for those of you that don't know, I have been invited to be a part of early access for Bloomboro. That's happening on July 24th. I believe it's Wednesday. It's going to be a 24 hour stream and I'm gonna lose my mind by the time it's over, but I've got some crazy ideas. I'm super excited to dig into that, so I hope to see you there. But with all of that out of the way, let's just dive right in. First, we're starting with Nettleguard. One white and one for a 3-1 mouse soldier with Valiant. Whenever it becomes the target of a spell or ability you control for the first time each turn, it gets plus zero, plus two until end of turn. I like that we have confirmation here that Valiant does more than just put plus one plus one counters on creatures because, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think every Valiant creature we've seen so far has given counters in some way. Um, so it's nice to see that kind of anything is up for grabs as an ability to trigger off of Valiant, which is really nice. But as, as if that wasn't enough, we've got pay one, sacrifice the Nettle Guard, destroy target artifact or enchantment. So, Honestly, kind of crazy for a common. A 3-1 for 2 mana that can trade up with a 3 toughness creature is already decent as a common piece that you can, you know, fill out your curve with in draft. The fact that you can sack it to disenchant whatever makes it one of the better commons, I think, for limited. But then the fact that it has this Valiant ability stacked on top and sometimes it's a 3-3 for 2 if you're targeting it just makes it even crazier and super pushed. So. In limited, this is going to be nuts. I still don't think it's quite there uh, for standard or anything like that, but uh, it's close. It's one of those commons that's close. I could see a world in which this saw play in standard. I don't necessarily think that's the case, but it definitely wouldn't be out of the question. Nice little card here. Next up, we have Polly Wallop. One green and three for an instant. It costs one less to cast for each frog you control, and target creature you control deals damage equal to twice its power to target creature you don't control. I like this spell a lot. Obviously, in Frog Tribal, you're going to want to grab this as quick as possible. It's going to be a very high pick. Probably even better removal in those decks than most of the uncommon removal that you'll have uh, open to you. Because it's going to cost one less for each frog, right? So if you're super deep into frogs, this could be just a one mana instant speed bite spell, which is already amazing. You don't have to fight, you just get to bite, you're not, your creature's not at risk, right? But on top of that, it's double damage. It's not just deal damage, it's deal double damage, so even your smaller creatures can kill bigger creatures at instant speed for potentially one mana. That seems pretty nutty for frog tribal. Granted, outside of Frog Tribal, it's not that great. You're still going to want to consider running it in Limited. You know, it might make the cut if you're a little light on removal and just need another piece. Or maybe if you do have a deck that's not necessarily deep into one tribe or another and has some frogs in it where you're not getting the full payoff, but it would still be decent, maybe consider running, running it too. But definitely in the Frog Tribal decks, it's going to be a very high pick. Next up, we have Starlit Soothsayer, a 2-2 flying bat cleric for one black and two. And at the beginning of your end step, if you gained or lost life this turn, surveil one. I don't love this guy. 2-2 uh, two -two flying for three is definitely not it anymore. Not for standard. Uh, power creep's a hell of a thing. And uh, this, this just, even with the bit of upside that you can surveil one every now and then when you're gaining or losing life, uh... It's, it's nice, it's a nice little bit of upside value, but uh, it's it's not really quite doing it for me. 
I think the one aspect of this card that will be most overlooked and where this could actually be pretty decent is just in Bat Tribal. The fact that it is a bat. If you have enough, you know, Bat Tribal payoffs, if you're deep enough into bats where you have tons of ways of making your bats way better than what they are on the surface, then this could be really good. It's a nice little evasive creature you can play that can pick up all of your bat synergies. So in the bat deck, if you have enough payoffs for bats, this actually could go up in value and be a pretty decent pick and maybe even where you want to be as far as your three drops in the deck. Uh, but I don't necessarily think that's going to be the case. And uh, outside of Bat Tribal, it's definitely kind of meh. If you're desperate for evasion, I guess you could run it, but not super impressed. Next up, we have Mockingbird, our first rare of the day. And one of my favorite cards in the set so far. This is a 1-1 bird bard with flying for one blue and X. And you may have Mockingbird enter as a copy of any creature on the battlefield with mana value less than or equal to the mana spent to cast Mockingbird. Except it's a bird in addition to its other types and it gets to keep flying no matter what. Uh, I think the most overlooked part of this card is it's the total mana cost you pay for Mockingbird. Uh, that it that it looks at for when you want to copy something so if your opponent has a ragavan and you want to copy the ragavan you just pay the one blue mana you don't have to pay anything into x it's not one blue plus x it's total casting cost so that's kind of crazy right you pay one blue and three and you could copy your opponent's shieldred um even even the, even the odds i think some people are looking at this and saying oh man x if I want to copy something really bomby, like an Atali or an Atraxa, I have to pay way too much mana, so this isn't that great. But I think there are plenty of things you can copy with this that are cheap, that are absolutely crucial linchpins of certain decks. So being able to have, like, copy 5 through 8 of a ridiculously synergistic or, or combo piece or something like that card seems really good. I think this is going to be way better than people realize. I just, I could see this coming down and enabling some really crazy stuff. I, al I already have a few ideas in mind. Uh, I'm not gonna share them just, just yet. They're up here, but I will have a first 10 brews video I'm putting up that are, you know, the first 10 brews I'm thinking about building and playing in early access for this set. And I'll probably be mentioning this, this card a couple times in that because I think there are some really cheap cards you could copy with this that could just completely go off the rails and be super broken and i'm pretty excited about it so i don't know i feel like this is the best clone we've got in oh maybe ever i don't know it's my favorite card back in the day was vesuvian doppelganger so every time i see some kind of a clone effect i always get a little bit more excited than i probably should so it's hard to say if i'm i'm too high on this card so let me know in the comments if you agree with me or not but either way i think we can all agree that this card is awesome Next up, we have Vine Reap Mentor. Two mana for a 3-2 Squirrel Druid in the colors of Golgari. And when it enters, or dies, you create a food token. I think this card is way better than anyone's going to give it credit for. On the surface, it just looks like it's a 3-2 for 2 with a little bit of upside that is negligible. And, uh, you know, I would, I, would, I would say that this is a lot better than just that. It's not just a 3-2 for 2. The fact that it creates a food when it when it enters or dies is huge. That means it's typically going to create two food tokens in a game. And the thing about food tokens in this set is they're way better than they would be just outside of this set because we have the forage ability in this set, which different cards with different forage abilities will allow you to sacrifice a food token to get a beneficial effect. So food tokens are way more important and way better in, in combination with these forage abilities then they would be just as food tokens right so i think making food tokens especially two of them off this guy uh it's going to be way better than it looks and then also the fact that it's a squirrel is going to be way more relevant than people realize at first there are going to be a ton of squirrel payoffs uh squirrel buffs and stuff like that squirrel su tribal synergies that this guy is going to be able to pick up just by being a squirrel. So when you take all of that into account and you really look at the card, I can understand why it's an uncommon. It seems like it's going to be really, really good. 
it's probably going to be underappreciated at first until people catch on to just how much value there is in it. And uh, yeah, I think it's it's going to be a very high pick in limited. Next up, we have Water Spout Warden. One blue and two for a 3-2 frog soldier. And whenever it attacks, if another creature entered the battlefield under your control this turn, it gains flying until end of turn. Not great. A three mana 3-2 three that only has flying sometimes is just kind of meh. That being said, it is a frog, it can pick up all your frog synergies, and if you're in a deck that's super wide with creatures, and you're playing a creature any turn, every turn anyway, then you're just getting flying every turn, so it's not awful. I don't think it's going to be a very high pick at all, it's kind of, it's not awful, but it's close to awful, right? But uh, if you are in the frog deck and you're coming up short on frogs, this is a nice little way to add more frogs into your deck to get those frog payoffs, and even though it's not the greatest creature in the world, it's also not awful right you'll be fine you'll run it it will keep pace with the opponent and uh later on you'll get your frog payoffs so it's okay next up we have drift gloom coyote two white and three for a three four elemental coyote and when it enters you exile target creature and opponent controls until drift gloom coyote leaves the battlefield if that creature had power two or less you put a plus one plus one counter on drift gloom coyote these uh, creatures with exile abilities are usually really, really good and tend to be a staple of any set that they're included in. That being said, this one is really expensive. 5 mana for a 3-4 that does this ability is not the greatest, right? That being said, it does have some upsides. It comes in, it can get a counter and be a 4-5, so you're getting a relevant threat on the battlefield in addition to getting rid of something. Uh, whereas normally when you play a creature with this kind of ability, it's so small that you don't really dare send it into combat, uh, or it's almost always going to trade with something and they're going to get their guy back and it's going to feel really bad. But this guy's actually big enough that he can come down and also continue to block. So I think in limited, he's actually going to be really, really good. Like really good. I think you can afford to wait until turn five to play it in limited. You can you know, have it come down and exile their best creature and then have a relevant body that you normally wouldn't have if it was a cheaper version that can really put in some work on a board that just lost its, you know, best creature on the other side. So I think, yeah, in limited, this is going to be absolutely nuts. I think it's going to be a high pick. I think it's probably going to be underestimated at first because of its high cost. But in constructed, I think... No matter how much upside you have for having a relevant body there, that 5 mana is just going to be a little too much. So I don't really see this quite making the cut in Constructed. Maybe if it was a relevant creature type, like a Rabbit or something like that, where it could fit into some really deep tribal themes. But it's not. It's Elemental and Coyote, and those aren't necessarily uh, focused tribes in this set. So I don't really expect there to be a lot of payoff. Tribally? Tribally, is that a word? tribalish tri I need coffee but anyway I don't expect there to be a ton of payoff for this outside of just what it's doing on the surface right so awesome and limited awesome 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 not quite good enough and constructed next up we have wick the world mind one black and three for a two four legendary rat warlock whenever it or another rat you control enters create a one one black snail creature token if you don't control a snail Otherwise, you put a plus one plus one counter on a snail you control. You can also pay three mana in the colors of Grixis and sack any snail, and he deals damage equal to the sacrifice creature's power to each opponent, and then you draw cards equal to the sacrifice creature's power. So, a nice little card here, honestly, I'm kind of loving this. It comes down, it can't be cut down, right? It can't be killed with a lightning strike or anything like that. It survives those things. Comes down, uh immediately makes a snail and then every rat that you play makes that snail bigger and bigger and bigger and then eventually you just pay three mana toss the snail right and do but do a bunch of damage to your opponent's head and draw a bunch of cards and refill your hand on a bunch of gas this is this is one of those cards where like you jam it and then you just start to put out threats and your opponent has to make difficult decisions about taking out the rat threats that you're playing or taking out this guy and if they don't take out this guy eventually you get a crazy payoff right where you just get to redraw your hand and do a bunch of damage 
But if they do take out this guy, you get a little bit of card advantage because it leaves behind the snail. And if you got to play a couple rats before they kill Wick, then your snail's a little bit bigger and, and maybe a little more relevant. So a lot of interesting things to consider for this card. Is it going to be good enough for Constructed? I'm not 100% sure. Four mana is a lot for a thing you want to get, get out before all your rats hit the battlefield. Um, that being said... Rat Tribal could end up being insane, and this could be super good in it. This could be the Shieldred of Rat Tribal. It's going to be really, really hard to tell until we test it out and try it, uh, but I am excited to try it because the potential is there for sure. Next up, we have Daring Wave Rider. Two blue and four for a 4-4 four, four Otter Wizard. When it enters, you may cast an instant or sorcery with mana value four or less from your graveyard without paying its mana cost. If that spell would be put into your graveyard, you exile it instead. So this is expensive, this isn't great, but this is a nice little bit of payoff late game for the otter deck, right? It's gonna pick up all your otter synergies and maybe even wizard synergies, and it's gonna get you automatic two for one value. It's gonna let you replay your best four drop or less, you know, instant or sorcery. And if you're playing an otter deck, that really matters because all of your otters will, tr will trigger off playing instants and sorceries and stuff like that. So being able to get that two for one value late in the game, get a relevant body that's going to pick up your otter synergies, replay your best instant, instant or sorcery, seems pretty good. That being said, six mana is a lot. So at most, I see this being like a one of at the top, the top end of that deck. That being said, I do think this has a better chance of seeing play than most other 6 drops would in the same situation, so at least 6 drops that are uncommon are common, right? So I think it's uh, it's definitely worth considering, but I, I would be very wary of playing more than one of these in your limited deck. Next up we have Bare Knuckle Boxer, a 3-2 Raccoon Berserker for 1 green and 1. Whenever you expend 4, Bare Knuckle Boxer gains indestructible until end of turn. I actually like this guy a lot. A 3-2 for 2 is pretty decent to begin with, and it being a raccoon is super relevant. It's going to pick up all those raccoon synergies. We've already seen one raccoon that lets you generate mana for each raccoon you have, so stuff like that is going to be really good with a nice on-rate 3-2 for 2 creature on curve. Uh, but in, in addition to that, you have this Expend 4 ability, and I think Expend is actually a little better than most people are going to give it credit for at first. I feel like I've said that about a fair number of things in this video already, but the thing that's cool about Expend is you don't have to, like, spend any extra mana or jump through any crazy hoops. You can mostly just do the things you would normally want to do anyway on your turn, and then just get these free abilities to trigger as long as you're not out of gas. So as long as you're spending at least four mana on playing spells during your turn, you're just going to trigger this for free, right? You don't have to spend any extra mana. You don't have to do anything crazy. You just play the stuff you want to play anyway, and it's just indestructible. And having that upside on a 3-2 for 2, that's going to get you all your raccoon payoffs just seems really good to me. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is a very high pick. I'm kind of loving the direction they're going with Expend, to be completely honest. Next up, we have Hearthborn Battler. One red and two for a 2-3 Lizard Warlock with haste, and whenever a player casts their second spell each turn, Hearthborn Battler deals two damage to target opponent. Now... This card, it's really hard to gauge. It could go either way. The fact that it's a lizard is obviously going to matter. The fact that it's a warlock means it could slot into outlaw tribal decks, which is really nice. And it's a nice little, you know, haste creature. That being said, it is only a 2-3 three for 3. Uh, I think the ability is a little bit better than it looks on the surface too, because it seems like... You know, it's only going to trigger every now and then, like you have to build your deck around casting two spells a turn so that you can get it to trigger, you have to jump through those hoops, but it's going to trigger off of other players double spelling as well. So if you double spell on a turn and they double spell on the same turn, you're doing four damage to an opponent in that just that one turn, right? And you could theoretically do it again on their turn, so you could do up to eight damage in a turn cycle if you're somehow able to cast like two one drops on your turn and on their turn and they're double spelling on your turn and their turn i know that's a lot that's not going to happen very off often but the potential is there 
So it's really hard to gauge a card like this. I think it really depends on what kind of support cards it has to back it up, but two damage can be super significant if you can trigger it very consistently. Another thing that's worth noting is in multiplayer, this guy gets way better because not only is it triggering every time, every single time another player double spells, which, you know, every player at the board, you know, at the table could technically double spell and you could get a whole bunch of triggers in one turn cycle. Um, but also you get to choose, you know, which, which player takes the two damage. So you can use this in a very political way to, you know, move games in one direction or another, and I kind of love that about the card. So, there's some interesting potential here. On the surface, doesn't quite look like it's good enough. It might be a little too slow for most, you know, damage-based aggro decks in red, um, but there could be a deck that springs up around this that just generates a ton of damage really quick if it has the right support. So, I'm gonna keep an open mind about it, but I'm leaning towards it just being not quite there in standard. Next up, we have Wix Patrol. This is two black and four for a 5-3 rat warlock. And when it enters, you mill three cards. And when you do, target creature and opponent controls gets minus X, minus X until end of turn, where X is the greatest mana value among cards in your graveyard. So really cool piece of card advantage, two for one, getting you removal and a very decent body if you have really expensive stuff in your graveyard. So pretty good in reanimator decks or maybe in ramp decks that have a lot of big creature payoffs at the end. You know, maybe you have those big creatures in your graveyard and you're able to kill something very big and significant with the minus X minus X. That being said, six mana is a lot. And I think how useful this is and how relevant it is in limited really relies on how likely you are to be ramping in decks that use this. If if you can consistently ramp at least one mana throughout the course of the game, like very consistently, and you know, this is coming down when you have five lands, then it's really good, I think. But if you're trying to just, you know, hard cast this on turn six with your sixth land drop, it gets a little trickier to make this, you know, valuable enough to see play. That being said, I'm never going to completely discount a two for one that's removal tacked onto a good body. So this could absolutely end up being awesome. And the fact that it's a rat really matters. The fact that it's a warlock could matter. So pretty interesting card. Excited to see if it's good enough. Next up, we have Persistent Marsh Stalker. This is a 3-1 rat berserker for one black and one. And it gets plus one plus O for each other rat you control, which is already kind of good in uh, rat tribal already going to be a very high power creature most likely for just two mana but it also has threshold whenever you attack with one or more rats if seven or more cards are in your graveyard you can pay three mana and if you do you return the persistent marsh stalker from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped and attacking that's what makes this card insane this is borderline good enough to be a rare not quite but it's definitely really good for an uncommon because the idea if you're going wide with rats especially if you're making rat tokens which rat decks tend to typically be good at. Uh, this guy's just a very high powered attacker and if you can just send him in every turn and force them to have to trade with him because you can just bring it back for another three mana the next turn, it starts to just add up value super quick uh, if, it just can, if it can just keep consistently coming back, right? So I think this card could be really good if you're going wide enough with rats, just keeps coming back as a very high powered attacker until eventually your opponent is out of things to trade with it. Uh, and that's just a ton of value. But it's also worth noting it's only got one toughness. It's never going to go beyond that toughness no matter how big it scales. Uh, and since it has one toughness, even a 1-1 token can just trade with it pretty easily. And there are a lot of things in this set that make 1-1 tokens, especially Rabbit Tribal. So I could see it going either way. In, in some cases, I could see this being absolutely crazy and dominating games. And in other cases, up against like a Rabbit deck or something, I could see this being very easily dealt with, with easy 1-1 tokens that you're making every turn, you know, without really without really much opportunity cost lost in dealing with it. So I think it's really, really good, but it definitely has its Achilles heel, so to speak. Uh, it'll be interesting to see just how good it ends up being on launch day. But next up, we've got Helga, Skittish Seer. This is a 1-3 legendary creature frog druid. Yes, it's a 1-3, not a 1-1. 
When I put this up as a spoiler short, I accidentally said 1-1, one, one, but you know what? I'm tired, so leave me alone. <laughs> it's a 1-3 frog druid for 3 mana in the colors of Bant, and whenever you cast a creature spell with mana value 4 or greater, you draw a card, gain a life, and put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Helga. That's a lot of value for your 3 drop. If that wasn't enough, you can also tap Helga and add X mana of one color, any one color, where X is Helga's power, and then you can only spend that mana to cast creature spells that have mana value 4 or greater, or creature spells that have X in their mana costs. Which is nice, because technically you can cast like a 2 drop or a 3 drop for uh, uh, with mana from Helga if it's an X spell. So it does help you get away from having to cast a very expensive thing. You can cast a cheap thing, it just has to be a cheap thing with X in the cost, right? And there are some cool cards in this set already. Um, there's probably going to be, you know, some kind of a Hydra deck that can use this pretty efficiently. And then, you know, we, we already saw like the Mockingbird, which would work really well with this. Uh, I just think it's awesome. If they don't kill Helga right away, it just starts to add up value. Every 4-drop you play is drawing you a card, and gaining you a life, and making this bigger, and then you're able to ramp into playing even more 4 or more drops. So, this is absolutely one of those cards that you have to deal with right away, or it eventually just takes over the game with value. And I'm curious if people are going to realize that right away. I could see this very easily slipping under people's radar and people going, uh, I'll wait until they cast a bigger threat and saving their removal and then realizing when it's too late that this absolutely needs to go, right? So, really cool card. Frog Tribal is looking awesome and I'm excited to experiment with it. Next up we have Take Out the Trash. One red and one for an instant. Take Out the Trash deals three damage to target creature or planeswalker. And if you control a raccoon, you may discard a card, and if you do, draw a card. Trash Pandas, I mean, it's your instant speed, 2 mana for 3 damage spell. That being said, you get a free rummage ability if you're in raccoons, so why not? I think uh, in the context of, of other removal spells at other rarities, this isn't great. But when you consider the fact that it's a common, and you can easily pick this up towards the end of a draft if you find yourself low on removal, uh, the value goes a little bit up. Um, you know, getting that opportunity to grab this at common is pretty relevant, and I think it's it's going to find a spot in Raccoon decks. Next up we have Paw Patch Formation. One green and one for an instant. You get to choose one. You destroy a creature with flying, destroy an enchantment, or draw a card and create a food token. This is a really, really good version of a card like this. We're used to seeing cards like this in green that let you, like, kill a flyer or destroy an enchantment or something like that. But the fact that you have a third mode here that is always going to be good, that's not situational, that lets you draw a card to replace it and get a little bit of upside value in creating a food token, which, like I said earlier in this video, is more relevant in this, for, uh, in this format, in this set, because of the forage ability. Uh, is actually really, really good. You basically get to play your flying removal and enchantment removal with without that opportunity cost, right? Without having to risk it sitting in your hand and being up against a deck where neither of those options are ever going to be useful. So because of that, I think this card is amazing. Probably one of the best flying or enchantment removal variants we've seen because it's just always going to be fine. It's always going to be usable for something, right? And I kind of love that. But next up, we've got Wax Wayne Witness. This is one white and three for a 2-4 Bat Cleric with flying and vigilance. And whenever you gain or lose life during your turn, it gets plus one plus O oh until end of turn. Not super amazing, but you could do a lot worse in your Bat Tribal deck. And again, this is one of those cards where if you're deep into Bat Tribal and you have enough Bat payoffs, this card gets significantly better. It's already kind of okay. 2-4 Flying Vigilance, it's always going to be able to block most flyers in Limited in the air while also swinging in for 2 every turn. And I think that's actually really good in Limited. It can sometimes get buffed up so that you're swinging for 3, which makes it even better. And it's going to pick up all your bat synergies, which, which makes it even better. I think it's really easy to dismiss this card at first and think it's just completely eh because it's 4 mana and 2 power, uh, but once you really think about the play lines and how this will be used, and the hopefully deep bat synergies you'll get to exploit with it, I think it gets better. So, 
You could do a lot worse than grab this as one of your commons to just fill out your bat decks. I think I think it'll see play. But next up we've got Dark Star Augur. Dark Star Augur. Another bat, speaking of good bats, this is a 2-3 bat warlock for 1 black and 2, so a little bit understated, but it does have offspring for just 1 black, which is super significant. That means if you pay an extra black when you cast this spell, when it enters you get to create a 1-1 one, one token copy of the bat that has all of the same abilities as the card. It even keeps the casting cost. So it's a 2-3 flyer for 3. Or a 2-3 flyer and a 1-1 flyer for 4. And both copies will have, at the beginning of your upkeep, reveal the top card of your library, put that card into your hand, you lose life equal to its mana value. So, it's a super Phyrexian Arena, sort of, or Dark Confidant, or, you know, whatever other analogy you want to make. But the fact that you could make two of these and be drawing two extra cards a turn, and even if they use spot removal to get rid of one of them, you still get to keep one. I think that's what makes this significant. I think I think it's more valuable as a way to dodge spot removal than as a way to actually draw two cards a turn. I think even if that's a lot of life that you don't want to spend, being able to pay the offspring cost and get two copies so that one of them eats removal from your opponent and you still have one to trigger that ability is super good. <laughs> I think that makes this card really good and uh, in some situations, you're going to want to draw those extra two cards a turn. And we've seen a lot of payoffs in Bat Tribal that care about losing life. So, you know, paying that life to get those cards in your hand are going to trigger all of those synergies. So if those synergies go as deep as I think they go, a card like this could actually be really insane where the only downsides are also kind of situationally upsides, which just makes the card even better. So... A double Phyrexian Arena with two flying bodies that can swing in every turn and get all of your bat synergies and capitalize off of lose life synergies? Sure. This seems insane. I love it. We're gonna play it. Next up we've got Gossip's Talent, another enchantment class because classes are back in this set. One blue and one. Whenever a creature you control enters, you surveil one. So nice little blanket effect here that lets all of your creatures trigger ETB you know, and surveil. For one blue and one, you can level it up to level two, and whenever you attack, target attacking creature with power three or less can't be blocked this turn. So every attack, something becomes unblockable. That seems pretty good for an uncommon. But then it also has level three. Pay one blue and three, you level it up to level three, and whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you may exile it and then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control. So this is definitely meant to be in a blink deck, right? Where you get extra value when you initially play it just off all of your tr all of your uh, creatures entering the battlefield. Every time they enter, you'll get to surveil. But then when you get to that level three, now all of your creatures get to enter additional times to trigger that surveil and also trigger whatever ETB abilities they have. Uh, and in the process, you get a little bit of unblock ability so that you have an automatic clock on your opponent and what's cool about the unblockability is it's not attached to a specific creature, so it's not like they can just kill an unblockable creature and stop it, right? If they kill a creature, next turn you just give something else unblockable. Like, you're always going to swing in with something unblockable, unless you're out of creatures. So, I think when you really think about how this card can be utilized, it's going to actually be pretty good. Uh, it, you, it is going to be a lot better in the blink decks. You definitely want to play this in the blink decks, and we haven't quite seen just how good those decks are yet, and just how deep the payoffs go for that kind of archetype, uh, especially in limited, but even in standard. So we'll have to wait until we see the whole set, but the potential is there, uh, and especially with a card like this. So really interesting. But next up, we've got Bumble Flowers Share Pot. This is an artifact for just two colorless mana. It's a common, and when it enters, you create a food token you can also pay 5 and tap it and sack it, destroy any non-land permanent, but activate that only as a sorcery. I kind of love this because it gives you 2 artifacts for 2 mana for just 1 card, so even outside of using it as removal, like getting 2 artifacts for 1 card for just a little bit of mana seems really good. One of them is a food token that you can use for forage abilities, uh, so if you're in a deck that cares about going wide with artifacts, or that cares about food tokens, this could be really good. And then later in the game, 
it just kind of removes stuff. You know, it's it's not as expensive. I think we saw a card similar to this in last set, but it costs six mana to do. This is only five. Uh, I think I think this cost is way more reasonable in limited for something like this. I would expect this to actually see a fair amount of play, especially as a common. It's really easy to grab this late in the draft if you're short on removal, and it can just slot into any deck. It doesn't even matter what colors you're running, right? So. It's going to be better in food decks, you're going to be able to get way more value off that food token by, you know, foraging and stuff like that. Um, but it's honestly not awful as removal that can just slot into anything. Next up we've got Into the Flood Maw. One blue for an instant. You may gift a tapped fish when you play it. Return target creature and opponent controls to its owner's hand, and if the gift was promised, instead return target non-land permanent and opponent controls to its owner's hand. So, basically, this is a one mana instant return any creature they have to their hand. No upside for them whatsoever. But if you need to target something that is a non-creature, like an enchantment or an artifact or some kind of a non-creature token so that they lose it forever, stuff like that, you can gift a tapped fish, give them a 1-1 one -one instead, and get rid of their big thing. So... I think it's kind of cool having that versatility. Obviously, you don't want to gift them a tap fish if you don't have to, but I mean, for one mana at instant speed, having that removal with potential upside seems pretty decent. Next up, we've got Season of Gathering, another mythic rare. This is two green and four for a sorcery, and you may choose up to five paw prints worth of modes. You may choose the same mode more than once. So, for one paw print, you put a plus one plus one counter on a creature you control, and it gains vigilance and trample until end of turn. For two paw prints, you get to choose an artifact or enchantment, destroy all permanents of the chosen type. And for three paw prints, you draw cards equal to the greatest power among creatures you control. The only thing I don't love about this is, in addition to it being one mana more than the other seasons we've seen so far, this is six mana, not five. It doesn't have a single mode that isn't reliant on the board state. If you want to put plus one plus one counters on things, you have to have creatures. If you want to use that second mode that removes artifact or enchantments, they have to have relevant artifacts or enchantments. And if you want to use that third mode to draw cards, again, you have to have a relevant creature on the board that's going to let you do that. So it's very, very dependent on the given board state. And that makes this a little bit more risky, in my opinion. That being said, this is a crazy finish, finisher in certain green decks, especially in limited, but it might even see playing constructed. Being able to put five plus one plus one counters on on five different creatures and give all of them vigilance and trample, you could just win the game. Or you could just like do it to three creatures and kill like their big bomby artifact or enchantment. Or you could just draw a bunch of cards and give two creatures to buff or draw a bunch of cards and kill an artifact or enchantment. The versatility, like all of the seasons, is really where this shines, so there is a lot of versatility to this. That being said, I do think it's probably the weakest of the seasons we've seen, just because it is so, so hyper-reliant on the board state. If you have no artifacts or enchantments to hit, and your creature board is crappy because they just wrathed or whatever, this is just a dead card in your hand, and that feels really bad. But I'm hoping it ends up better in practice than it feels like it is, because right now it's definitely my least favorite of the seasons, but there's absolutely ways to abuse this and get a lot of value off of it for sure. Next up we've got Bandit's Talent. One black and one for an enchantment class, so it's another class here. When it enters, each opponent discards two cards unless they discard a non-land card. So. The fact that this is just getting value out of their hand right off the bat and then has two other levels it can level up to to get you more value seems crazy even without knowing what those two things are, but let's figure that out right now. One black mana, you level it up to level two. That is not a lot of mana. At the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, if that player has one or fewer cards in hand, they lose two life. So it also becomes a pseudo win condition if you're big into discard decks where you're just making them discard so much that they're always going to have little to no hand. It's just a win condition tacked on to your early discard. That also seems good. And then level 3 for 1 black and 3, it picks up the ability to, at the beginning of your draw step, 
draw an additional card for each opponent who has one or fewer cards in hand. I kind of love this, and this seals the deal that I want to make a very, very discard focused deck in Constructed, in Standard, when the, sick, when the set comes out, because there's just so many good discard cards already, Hopeless Nightmare, stuff like that. We saw one new discard card already in this set. I believe it was a one mana discard card that flashes back and makes them discard again and draws you a card when it's flashed back. So a lot of crazy discard value, it seems like, uh, is coming in this set. Just being able to make them discard early and then get all this extra value, a free win condition, free card draw to like gas up your hand uh, when you start running out of gas. This just seems awesome. I want to build that deck. Maybe it's a Nurturing Fairy deck. Nurturing Pixie? Nurturing Pixie deck. I'm tired. But uh, either way. <laughs> either way, we're going to build it. That deck seems crazy. Next up, we have Frilled Spark Shooter. One red and three for a 3-3 three, three Lizard Archer with Menace and Reach. And it enters with a plus one plus one counter on it if an opponent lost life this turn. Actually seems pretty good at common. As long as you're playing this in the right deck that's aggressive enough, they're almost always going to lose, you know, life during combat, and then you play this second main. So if you're dropping this during your second main on turn 4, as a 4-4 four, four Menace Reach for 4 mana, that's really, really on rate. That's really good for what you're getting. So 4-4 four, four Menace Reach seems like it'll be pretty nuts and limited. So it's all about the consistency of getting to that point, making sure you're always hitting for that damage on turn four, playing a very aggressive deck. And let's not forget, this is also a lizard, so it's gonna pick up your lizard synergies, right? And that makes it even a little bit better. So if you're in a very aggressive lizard deck where you get those lizard synergies and you can very consistently make sure this is gonna come down on turn four as the four four, this card will be really good. Uh, and in those decks, I think you're gonna pick this up a little bit higher. That being said, if you're not necessarily in a deck like that, this could still be worth playing as a 22nd, 23rd card. It's never going to be useless, so nice little bit of value. Next up, we have Long River Lurker. One blue and two for a 2-3 Frog Scout with Ward 1. Gives all of your other frogs Ward 1, and when it enters, target creature control can't be blocked this turn. Whenever that creature deals combat damage this turn, you may exile it, and if you do, Return it to the battlefield under its owner's control. So much value on this card for a 3-drop, right? Having Ward 1 makes it tricky to get rid of. Giving all of your frogs Ward 1 makes it especially good in Frog Tribal. And then, you know, getting this last ability online where, you know, when you deal combat damage, you can pretty much flicker or, or blink the creature. Um, and that can trigger what? Off of any one creature? Yeah... Every time a creature enters, you give one thing unblockability, and then you get to flicker it. So, as long as you can consistently play a creature each turn, which we've seen a lot of frogs so far that are good at returning creatures to your hand every turn and letting you recast them, so as long as you are replaying a creature every turn, you're able to trigger that every turn, have something be unblockable, anything be unblockable every turn, and get extra ETB value off of it when it connects, Seems like it's a hugely, hugely crazy enabler if you're in the right deck. Obviously, it needs the rest of the pieces to to reinforce that strategy. But if you have the right frogs to play with this, this card's going to be bananas. <laughs> I can't wait to try to build Frog Tribal Unlimited because it's looking gnarly. But next up, we've got Whisker Veil Forerunner. This is one white and three for a 3-4 Mouse Bard with Valiant. And that's it. It's a 3-4 Mouse Bard with Valiant, so this Valiant trigger better be good. Whenever Whisker Veil Forerunner becomes the target of a spell or ability you control for the first time each turn, look at the top 5 cards of your library, you may reveal a creature card with mana value 3 or less from among them, and you may put it onto the battlefield if it's your turn. If you don't put it onto the battlefield, put it into your hand, and put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So this is a ton of value if you're able to just target this thing every single turn. Every time you target it, you're able to, you know, pick up another creature card and just slam it onto the battlefield for free, which seems insane. You could target it with a one mana spell, right? And get to play a three, three drop creature off the top of your library for free off of playing a one mana spell. So that seems kind of crazy. Is this... 
Is this going to see play in Constructed? Is this standard worthy? It's really hard to know. I think if Mouse Tribal is good enough, this sees play. I think if you're just vomiting out your hand and building a crazy board of, you know, mice really early to the point where you can afford to just jam this on turn four and then start to get insane payoff, or maybe you play it on turn five so that you can ta uh, target it with a one drop uh, spell and trigger that Valiant on the turn you play it, that could be decent. I think that's the way to go. I think that's where this card shines. I think it it looks not good enough on the surface because you think about it in terms of playing it on turn four using all of your mana and only having a three four and not doing anything else and having to wait another whole turn before you can trigger the Valiant. But I don't think that's the way you play this. I think you vomit out your hand turn one through four, turn five you play this and you target it, right? You target it with a one drop spell and you get that free value immediately, and then even if they kill the Forerunner, you still got the free 3-drop onto the battlefield, and if they don't kill it, you can use it again next turn, uh, so it can really start to gas you up at that point in the game when you're running out of gas. So, will it be good enough? Hard to say. 4-drops, uh, 5-drops, really have to be super powerful these days to make the cut in standard, but um, there's potential there. There's potential for sure. Next up, we have Light Shell Duo. One blue and three for a 3-4 Rat Otter with Prowess. And also, when it enters, you Surveil too. So, not great, but a nice little bit of filler for the Rat or Otter deck. I think the thing that makes this especially good is the fact that it is both a Rat and an Otter. So, it can pick up all of your Tribal Synergies for both. Um, and that makes it a little bit better than it otherwise would be. I like the idea that a lot of these common creatures have two different tribes that are a part of the 10 tribe, you know, greater picture of the set because there's 10 main tribes, one for each color pair, um, that are the focus, you know, those aren't the only creatures, creature types in the set, but they're the focus. Um, and I like that the commons have these creatures that kind of combine two different creature types in the same, in the same card. So really cool that they can be used as, you know, filler cards for either tribal deck. Um, but really interesting that you might be able to utilize two different types of tribal synergies on the same card. So there's potential here, but at the end of the day, it's a common. You know, you'll run it if you need a rat or an otter in your deck. Next up, we have Cliff Top Lookout. This is a 1-2 Frog Scout with Reach for 1 green and 2. And when he enters, you reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a land card. Put that card onto the battlefield tapped and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So, a lot like that card we saw from Outlaws of Thunder Junction. Uh, I forget exact, what was it? A 3-3 Vigilance that triggers and can, can trigger every turn. Nowhere near as good as that, right? This is a much smaller body and it's only triggering once. That being said, it's just an uncommon, right? It's going to get you a little bit of value, uh, get you a land maybe. Definitely, because you reveal cards from the top until you reveal a land, so it will always grab you a land, right? Put it onto the battlefield tapped. Yeah, this is really good. Honestly. And I'm starting to see frog, frog tribal decks really come together here, because this is a perfect target to return to your hand with all of the frog synergies we've seen so far that return creatures to your hand, and replay to ramp out even more lands, right? So, getting all your frog synergies getting a free land onto the battlefield, that two-for-one card advantage, and then potentially getting the, the opportunity to replay it turn after turn with some of your, your frog synergies to keep getting lands. All of that seems really interesting. Will it be too slow? Hard to say, but it's definitely worth trying in limited for sure. I don't think it'll quite make the cut in standard, but I don't know. It really depends just how much that land is going to matter and how consistent and easily you can get it to trigger. Next up we see Plume Creed Escort, a 2-1 bird scout for 1 blue and 1 with flash and flying. And when it enters, target creature you control gains hexproof until end of turn. So nice little combat trick here, but honestly the fact that it's a 2 power flying body for 2 mana makes this really good regardless. You can flash it in and then just have a nice little evasive body. That just seems great. It's also a bird, so it's gonna uh, pick up all of your bird synergies, right? But being able to give a creature hexproof until end of turn, play it as a 
you know, protection spell that fizzles their targeted removal, protects your guy, and puts a 2-1 flyer onto the battlefield at instant speed for just the two mana. Just seems like you're getting a lot. I kind of love this, especially as an uncommon. Just seems really good, like one of the better uncommons. It just, I don't know man, Get, getting your protection spell on a flash flying 2-1 for two seems, it seems really good. I like it. It gets played in bird tribal, but it also gets played in probably anything blue. Next up we have for the common good, one green and double X for a sorcery. You create X tokens that are copies of target token you control, and then tokens you control gain indestructible until your next turn, and you gain one life for each token you control. Pretty cool little card, honestly. Uh, I would love this as nice sweeper protection, where your giant board becomes double giant and gets that indestructible so that your opponent can't sweep on their next turn, which means you get to untap and swing with everything on the turn after before they get a chance to sweep the board, and I love that. Unfortunately, this is coming into a standard where we have Sunfall. Theoretically, if once eventually down the line, Sunfall rotates uh, out of standard and we don't have a sweeper that exiles anymore, this card could become really, really good and eventually be worth building around uh, in that format, whatever that standard format ends up looking like down the line. Um, but as of right now, we're in a Sunfall standard and it doesn't quite work as good. That being said, if all of the tokens that you're making copies of have haste and you can just swing with everything right away and everything has indestructible, that seems crazy. Even if you just use it the fair way, right, where you're making a bunch of copy copies of your tokens and even though the copies can't swing right away, all of the tokens that you made copies of are getting indestructible and can swing and your opponent has to either chump block or uh, let them through and you have twice as many tokens and you gain the extra life even using it the fair way seems like it could be pretty good it's obviously going to be a lot better in a deck that can ramp produce a bunch of mana so that you can pump more mana into x so whatever deck makes a whole bunch of mana and makes a whole bunch of tokens in the process of making that mana that can fuel a big one big for the common good cast that actually has a lot of relevant targets Whatever that deck is, this will be great in. What is that deck? What does that deck look like? Does it even exist? I don't know, but if you have ideas, definitely let me know in the comments. Next up, we have Hidden Grotto, a colorless common land. When it enters the battlefield, you surveil one. It taps for one colorless mana, but it's also a filter land. You can pay one mana and tap it to add a mana of any color. This card's decent, right? It's going to be your, your fixing. You're not going to add more than one to a deck. But if you do need to, you know, worry about your fixing a little bit, having just one copy of this where it gets to filter and gets to surveil you one card closer to maybe the color that you're missing uh, is pretty decent. So, eh, it's, it's fine. It's a nice little filter land for limited. Next up we have Night Fisher, 2 blue and 3 for a 4-5 flying bird knight. And whenever another non-token bird you control enters, you create a 1-1 blue fish creature token. So every bird you play is going to make you a free fish token. That seems good in bird tribal, right? This is definitely meant to be like your top end card for bird tribal in limited. Like you build up to playing this and then all of the birds that you're playing are going to make you these 1-1 fish creatures and you're going to get extra value off everything that you play. It's also a pretty decent flying beat stick right? 4-5 flyer for 5. But I think where this card really excels is in an archetype we've started to see hinted at where the deck cares about you having a number of non-flyers and a number of flyers. I can't remember any of the specific cards off the top of my uh, off the top of my head, but we've seen multiple cards so far where they incentivize you to have flyers and non-flyers and the flyers and non-flyers affect each other in certain ways like the flyers can give your non non-flyers flying until end of turn things like that uh, where you can get extra value if you have non-flying creatures to pair with your flying creatures uh, 
And so if you're in that archetype, if you're going deep into that, depending on how good that archetype ends up being, something like this that can let you go even deeper into that, provide you free non-flying tokens to go with every flyer, seems really good. So um, I'm hoping that deck ends up going deep enough to be worth playing and that that archetype ends up being really cool because this could be a really cool top end uh, card for, for something like that. But next up we have Overprotect, one green and one for an instant, target creature you control gets plus three plus three and trample, hexproof, and indestructible until end of turn. So for one mana more than a giant growth, we get trample, hexproof, and indestructible. What makes this card important is the fact that it is, it's instant speed. Obviously the hexproof would be useless if it wasn't, but being able to have your protection spell and your ramp spell in the same instant speed spell is pretty crucial, even if it does cost two mana instead of instead of one. Um, but it's also just a game ender, right? Sometimes you could just give your dude trample and indestructible and just swing in uh, and finish the game with an extra three power on a trampling creature. So it kind of plays triple duty. Yeah, you know, it's it's a protection spell. Either hexproof or indestructible can help make it a protection spell, or it's your instant speed. Like, oh, I need to block your thing and kill it, so I'm gonna buff it up uh, and block it and kill it with Indestructible, which is worth worthy of note. Uh, but it's also your, your you know, finisher late in the game where if you're just a few points short, give your dude trample, buff up his power, do the thing. So it's very versatile, can be used in a lot of different situations. And because of that, I think it's better than a lot of like the two mana combat tricks we've seen in green in the last few sets. I kinda like it, I kinda like it. Next up we have Wishing Well, another rare. This is one blue and three for an artifact. You can tap it and put a coin counter on it. When you do, you may cast target instant or sorcery with mana value equal to the number of coin counters on Wishing Well from your graveyard without paying its mana cost. And if that spell would be put into your graveyard, exile it instead. Activate only as a sorcery. So, you put this down, you tap it, you play and opt from your graveyard for free. Next turn, you tap it, play a 2-drop from your graveyard for free. Next turn, you tap it, play a 3-drop from your graveyard for free. This gets out of hand really quick, and uh, it allows you to just recast all of your instants and sorceries. That being said, you're not going to be able to recast... Well... Hmm. Yeah, it's mana value equal to the number of coin counters, right? So you're not going to be able to cast a 1-drop and then a 2-drop, and then if you only have a 1-drop, cast another 1-drop the third time that you tap it. You have to do a 1-drop, and then a 2-drop, and then a 3-drop. And that makes this card a little difficult to build around, right? That's that's a lot of hoops to jump through. If it was, you know, equal, equal to or less than the number of coin counters on it, this would be way, way better. You'd be able to recast something almost every turn, as long as you just have something in your graveyard to hit. And the size of the thing you could recast would just get bigger and bigger. But the fact that you have to cast something equal to the number of coin counters on it makes it really tricky. That means you have to build your deck with a very even amount of casting costs among your instants and sorceries, which is not typically what those decks are trying to do. So I'm worried that this card is just not quite good enough to see any play at all. But that being said, it could. Who knows? And if there's ways to take counters off of things, that makes this a little bit better because you can start reducing coin counters if you need to play something that costs a little less and, uh, you know, have to kind of play around upping and downing the value, you know, of how many coin counters are on this. That could be really cool. But at the end of the day, I think there's just too many hoops to jump through. And I think the fact that you have to play a very specific instant or sorcery uh, you know, with, with mana value equal to the coin counters, exactly, makes it really tricky to pull off. So I'm not sure. That being said, thematically, it's a flavor win, and I kind of love it. So it's really sad that it's not quite good enough, I don't think. But uh, if you disagree with me, let me know in the comments. Next up, we have 3 Tree Scribe. This is one green and one for a 2-3 Frog Druid. Whenever it or another creature you control leaves the battlefield without dying, you put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. So this is nice payoff for the frog deck that's constantly trying to return things to your hand and have you recast them, right? If this is on the battlefield, you just keep getting value. Every single time something gets 
bounce back to your hand to be recast, you're getting an extra counter. You get to put it on whatever you want. That can get really out of hand. And the fact that this is a 2-3 for 2 mana means that it's kind of on rate for the cost anyway, so it's just sheer upside getting these counters. So if you're deep enough into Frog Tribal where you can keep, you know, bringing stuff back to your hand and recasting it, this is going to add up really quick and be really crazy. So I think this is actually going to be a key part of that deck in Limited. Uh, be really interesting to see if it's good enough to be standard worthy. I'm not sure yet. The potential is there for sure, but a card like this is definitely on the fence of like, does this make the cut? Does this end up being standard worthy? Or is this one of the cards that gets left on the wayside when you're building the standard version of that deck? We'll have to wait and see. Next up we have Harvest Right Host. This is a 3-3 Rabbit Citizen for 1 white and 2. Whenever it or another rabbit you control enters, target creature you control gets plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn, and then draw a card if this is the second time this ability has resolved this turn. So right off the bat, if you play a rabbit that has offspring, it'll make it so that two creatures enter no matter what. You'll trigger this twice, give two different creatures plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn, and draw a card. And that's insane. So if you're going wide, you have cheap creatures so that you can always double trigger this. This is going to be great. Even if you're not going wide necessarily, but you have a lot of ways to make extra token creatures, you have access to this offspring ability, uh, you have additional ways of getting that card draw. So this could very, very quickly spiral out of control into a lot of consistent card draw while also buffing your team and sending them in every, every turn. So. I think this card is actually really good, specifically because it's in Rabbit Tribal, and it's going to get those payoffs, and it's going to, going to be paired up with a lot of ways of making creature tokens. I, I expect this card to be pretty significant and pretty consistently actually trigger, but even if you have like one turn where you're not getting two creatures onto the battlefield that turn, maybe you're just getting one, you can still get that plus one plus oh trigger, and that on the back of a 3-3 three, three for three isn't awful. So I think this card is nothing but upside in the decks that want to play it, and uh, I, th I think this is going to be a pretty good card in Limited. But next up we have Long River's Pull. Two blue mana for an instant. You may gift a card as you play it, which means you promise the gift, and they get to draw that card before the rest of the spell resolves. And then when the spell resolves, you counter target creature spell. If the gift was promised, instead counter target spell. This is pretty cool. Basically, you counter any creature spell for 2 mana at instant speed, but it has this little bit of upside where if you desperately need to counter a non-creature spell, you can do that for still just 2 mana. You just have to let your opponent draw a card. So, I think you run this with, with the goal of countering creatures, right, and not having to give them that card advantage, but just having that, you know, versatility, almost like a charm of if you're in a desperate position and they're playing a non-creature spell that's good enough, you have a way to at least stop that bomby play. You just have to let them draw a card in the process. So, nice versatility here. I'm kind of liking it. As far as counter spells go, that counter creature spells, I think this is one of the better ones. But next up we have Balin the Haymaker. Another rare and one of my favorite cards of the day. This is a 4-3 legendary rabbit warrior for 3 mana in the colors of Naya, and it pretty much just does everything. You tap 2 untapped tokens you control to add a mana of any color, so all of your tokens become ramp. You can tap 3 untapped tokens you control to draw cards, so all of your tokens become card draw. You can tap 4 untapped tokens you control to put 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters on Balin, and it gains trample until end of turn. So. This reminds me a lot of that one drop that a lot of the Boros Convoke uh, decks are using right now as, uh, you know, the thing that can get buffed up with counters by ta tapping tokens. Or really tapping anything I think that card can. Um, and then eventually it gets some keyword abilities if, if it gets big enough. This kind of reminds me of that. It can tap any tokens, but not any permanents. So it doesn't have to be creature tokens, right? It can be blood tokens or food tokens or whatever. That makes food token cards better if you have a Balin in your deck. Um, but I wonder if this means that Naya Convoke is going to be a really good standard deck. Does the Boros Convoke deck that we've seen in recent weeks end up just becoming Naya Convoke deck? Uh, a Naya Convoke deck instead 
once this set becomes legal. Payoffs like this, letting you get insane value for all of your tokens, definitely a possibility. Really, really interesting. And the fact that that deck runs, you know, that one drop card that makes three goblin tokens by getting rid of an artifact and also runs a lot of things that make artifact tokens, all of that artifact, all of those artifact tokens can be tapped down with Balin four abilities and the goblin tokens can be tapped down. That's not even to say like what kind of new crazy rabbit token, food token shenanigans we're up to just in this set in general. So I'm really curious if this card ends up being good enough to see a new type of Convoke deck rear its ugly head. Instead of it being Boros Convoke going forward, the Naya Convoke actually ends up being the better Convoke deck. The potential is definitely there. Even outside of that, just jamming this in Rabbit Tribal and using a lot of things that make Rabbit tokens might end up being good enough in and of itself. So there's a lot of potential for this guy in Standard. Uh, and it'll be really interesting to see if it gets there and if, if this actually ends up being the status quo for those kinds of decks moving forward. So really interesting card. Definitely has a ton of potential for the power. Even just being a 4-3 for 3 is kind of nuts. So I kind of love it. But next up, we have Husk Burster Swarm. This is one black and seven for a 6-6 six, six elemental insect with menace and death touch. That is a big boy, but eight mana is an awful lot. Why is that irrelevant? Because this costs one less to cast for each creature card you own in exile and in your graveyard. That seems insane to me. Not only are self mill decks gonna love this because it can come down as a 6-6 six, six menace death toucher for one mana if you fill up your graveyard fast enough, but even if you're exiling things from your graveyard, this doesn't care. It still gets the cost reduction. So if you're in like an Insidious Roots decks where you're filling up your graveyard with creatures, exiling them to make plant tokens, this doesn't even care that beco they're becoming exiled. Like this will still come out as a 6-6 six, six Menace Death Touch, uh, Menace Death Touch for one mana a lot of times in that deck. And really in any kind of Surveil deck or any kind of exile your own graveyard for whatever deck if you're running a deck with forage with a lot of forage and maybe exiling a lot of cards from your graveyard to use forage abilities that could still get value off of a husk burster swarm so a lot of potential for a card like this the fact that it cares about the cards just being in exile uh not just in your graveyard makes it way way better like i said especially for those insidious roots decks that's the place where i expect to see this pop up the most but even in, in Limited, I, I think this will find a home in certain decks that are, you know, surveil style decks. Next up, we have Curious Forager. One green and two for a 3-2 Squirrel Druid. And when he enters, you may forage. When you do, return target permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. So seeing some nice little forage payoff here. Three mana for a 3-2 that just lets you exile three cards to get any permanent back to your hand. Seems like really good value in the mid game, uh, in limited specifically. But then even in the food decks, this gets way better, where you could just sack a food and get an automatic two for one. So it's possible a card like this sees standard play if food decks and forage decks end up becoming good enough. I don't think it's likely. Three mana for a three two, even with this upside, is a little slow for what green probably wants to do. But it still has the potential. Like, it's an automatic two-for-ones. In some cases, it's it's not even an opportunity cost, you know, to do that. Because you want access to the squirrel, and it's decently on rate having three power. But it's not great. So, as it stands right now with what we've seen, I don't think it's quite there for standard. But it has the potential to get there for standard. And in limited, it's going to be nuts. Like, this goes in the deck and gets you two for one card advantage just by things going to the graveyard over the course of the game. And that's gonna be really good. But the next card we have here is Mouse Trapper. One white and two for a three two Mouse Soldier with Flash, which is already okay because Mouse Tribal is gonna be relevant, but it also has Valiant. Whenever it becomes the target of a spell or ability you control for the first time each turn, tap target creature and opponent controls. So. If you just target it with a buff spell every turn, you're tapping down their best blocker every turn. And being able to do that in conjunction with Flash is kind of interesting. You could say, turn 4, flash this in on their turn before they declare blocks, and then immediately target it with a 1 mana instant spell, 
and tap down their thing you don't want them to attack with so that they can't attack with it. Then go to combat and they can attack, sure, but they can't attack with the best thing they were going to attack with. And even if they do attack, you now have an extra 3-2 body that could potentially trade with another creature they're swinging with. So a lot of potential value here, a lot of interesting combat tricks you can do. But even just tapping down a blocker when you're swinging seems interesting. So yeah, I think this is going to be pretty cool. Especially in Mouse Tribal, you know, in Limited, but uh, I like it as a nice little trick. And the last card of the day, Dragon Hawk Fates Tempest. We answered the question, guys. Are we going to get a dragon in this not-so-dragon, only animal-themed set? And the answer is yes, kind of. Yes, it's yes. This is a 5-5 legendary bird dragon, so it is a dragon, but it's also a bird. Uh, for 2 red and 3, and whenever it enters or attacks, exile the top X cards of your library where X is the number of creatures you control with power 4 or greater. You may play those cards until your next end step. At the beginning of your next end step, Dragonhawk deals 2 damage to each opponent for each of those cards that are still exiled. So, I think what people are going to think right away is this card is too slow and not quite good enough. Because they're going to look at it and say, okay, this is a 5 drop. And it exiles cards equal to creatures you control with power 4 or greater. So you have to play with big creatures. But if you're playing with big creatures, then whatever you're casting, you know, if you're casting this, it's everything's going to be too expensive. And so you're not going to necessarily be able to uh, play everything that you're exiling very efficiently. But the fact that anything that you don't play just deals two damage to each opponent is what makes this crazy so if you're even just playing one big creature each turn and your board's getting bigger and bigger with four power or more creatures every time this swings it's going to be able to do a ton of damage if you exile just one card the turn that you play this you can't play that card that turn probably because you don't have the mana especially if you're just deep into creatures that have power four or more but they'll still take the two damage at the end of the turn, right? Because you exiled a card. And then on your next turn, if you play another big creature and then swing, you get to exile two cards. And even if you, again, don't have mana to play whatever you're exiling because you spent it all to play your other big creature, you still get to hit them for four at the end of turn. This is a must, must, must answer threat. But even if they answer it with instant speed... At the end of turn, you you still get to do two damage at least. It at least did something, right, before they get to kill it. So, I think this is way better than maybe it appears. On the surface, I feel like it appears slow, like it's a five mana do nothing. But really, it is a must answer threat that will win the game pretty much by itself if it doesn't get taken care of. And even if it does get taken care of, it can get you a little bit of extra value in the meantime. And I kind of love that. So... It's not like the craziest card of all time, but I do think it's better than people are going to give it credit for. And I think it's really interesting that it can just constantly do damage to the opponent, just straight to the opponent's face, if you're not casting those cards that get exiled. So, really interesting card. I love that they found a way to fit dragons into this set by making it a bird dragon. Uh, just perfect. I wouldn't have thought of that, and I kind of love it. But... That's the last card of the day. That's going to do it for this video. I know it was a long one, but like I said, we, we rounded up all of the, the spoilers from Friday, Saturday, and Sunday into one weekend spoiler video so that you guys could just catch them all in one, one hit, one go, in one video, right? And uh, I didn't have to waste your time just splitting your attention between three different smaller videos. So those are all the videos, uh, sorry, all the spoilers for this video for the weekend. Uh, I hope you, you loved it. I, I loved some of that stuff. I mean, honestly, the new clone seems crazy. Uh, the new Naya rabbit seems bonkers as well. So some really interesting, crazy stuff. Like the video if you haven't already. Do you guys liking the video? That's helped this channel to grow so fast. Hitting 10K subscribers, blazing right past. Thank you guys so much. We are well on our way to 11. Let's go. If you're new here, subscribe so you never miss an upload. More spoiler videos are on the way, and I've got some crazy deck ideas up here. We're going to hit the ground running on early access, so make sure to catch that on July 24th. That's a Wednesday, 
24-hour stream over at twitch.tv slash quarantine capricorn because if I'm alive and I'm breathing, I'm there and I'm streaming, but right now I'm out of breath and I'm tired, so I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for checking out my channel. I'd like to give a huge shout out to all of my patrons over at Patreon. Without you guys, this channel would not be possible. So honestly, thank you from the bottom of my heart for all of your contributions. If you haven't yet, like and subscribe. The more likes we get and the quicker we get them, the bigger this channel will grow and the faster it will grow. I'd love nothing more than this channel to become something very special for you guys, but it's entirely up to you how fast that happens. Also, if you'd like more deck text, that's somewhere over there. And if you'd like to see what else the channel's been up to lately, that's somewhere up that way. Also, subscribe, circle below, do all the things.